Section 15 of Jataka Tales by H. D. Francis and E. J. Thomas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Grateful Elephant. Once upon a time, when Brahmadatta was king of Benares, there was a village of carpenters not far from the city, in which five hundred carpenters lived. They would go up the river in a vessel and enter the forest, where they would shape beams and planks for house buildings, and put together the framework of one story or two story houses numbering all the pieces from the main post onwards these then they brought down to the river bank and put them all aboard then rowing down stream again they would build houses to order as it was required of them after which when they received their wage they went back again for more materials for the building and in this way they made their livelihood once it befell that in a place where they were at work in shaping timbers a certain elephant trod upon a splinter of acacia wood which pierced his foot and caused it to swell up and fester and he was in great pain in his agony he caught the sound of these carpenters cutting wood there are some carpenters will cure me thought he and limping on three feet he presented himself before them and lay down close by the carpenters noticing his swollen foot went up and looked there was the splinter sticking in it with a sharp tool they made incision about the splinter and tying a string to it pulled it right out then they lanced the gathering and washed it with warm water and doctored it properly and in a very short time the wound was healed grateful for this cure the elephant thought my life has been saved by the help of these carpenters now i must make myself useful to them so ever after that he used to pull up trees for them or when they were chopping he would roll up the logs or bring them their adzes and any tools they might want holding everything in his trunk like grim death and the carpenters when it was time to feed him used to bring him each a portion of food so that he had five hundred portions in all now this elephant had a young one white all over a magnificent high-bred creature the elephant reflected that he was now old and he had better bring his young one to serve the carpenters and himself be left free to go so without a word to the carpenters he went off into the wood and brought his son to them saying this young elephant is a son of mine you saved my life and i give him to you as a fee for your leech craft from henceforth he shall work for you so he explained to the young elephant that it was his duty to do the work which he had been used to do himself and then went away into the forest leaving him with the carpenters so after that time the young elephant did all their work faithfully and obediently and they fed him as they had fed the other with five hundred portions for a meal his work once done the elephant would go play about in the river and then return again the carpenter's children used to pull him by the trunk and play all sorts of pranks with him in water and out now noble creatures be they elephants horses or men never dung or stale in the water so this elephant did nothing of the kind when he was in the water but waited until he came out upon the bank one day rain had fallen up river and by the flood a half-dry cake of his dung was carried into the river this floated down to the benares landing place where it stuck fast in a bush but then the king's elephant keepers had brought down five hundred elephants to give them a bath but the creatures scented this soil of a noble animal and not one would enter the water up went their tails and off they all ran the keepers told this to the elephant trainers who replied there must be something in the water then so orders were given to cleanse the water and there in the bushes this lump was seen that's what the matter is cried the men so they brought a jar and filled it with water next powdering the stuff into it they sprinkled the water over the elephants whose bodies then became sweet at once they went down into the river and bathed when the trainers made their report to the king they advised him to secure the elephant for his own use and profit the king accordingly embarked upon a raft and rowed upstream until he arrived at the place where the carpenters had settled the young elephant hearing the sound of drums as he was playing in the water 
came out and presented himself before the carpenters, who one and all came forth to do honor to the king's coming, and said to him, Sire, if woodwork is wanted, what need to come here? Why not send and have it brought to you? No, no, good friends, the king answered. Tis not for wood that I come, but for this elephant here. He is yours, sire. But the elephant refused to budge. What do you want me to do, gossip elephant? asked the king. Order the carpenters to be paid for what they have spent on me, sire. Willingly, friend. And the king ordered a hundred thousand pieces of money to be laid by his tail and trunk, and by each of his four feet. But this was not enough for the elephant. Go he would not. So to each of the carpenters was given a pair of cloths, and to each of their wives robes to dress in, nor did he omit to give enough whereby his playmates, the children, should be brought up. Then, with a last look upon the carpenters and the women and the children, he departed in company with the king. To his capital city the king brought him, and city and stable were decked out with all magnificence. He led the elephant round the city in solemn procession, and thence into his stable, which was fitted up with splendor and pomp. There he solemnly sprinkled the elephant, and appointed him for his own riding. Like a comrade he treated him, and gave him the half of his kingdom, taking as much care of him as he did of himself. After the coming of this elephant, the king won supremacy over all India. In course of time, the Bodhisatta was conceived by the queen consort, and when her time was near come to be delivered, the king died. Now, if the elephant learnt news of the king's death, he was sure to break his heart. So he was waited upon as before, and not a word said. But the next neighbor, the king of Kosala, heard of the king's death. "'Surely the land is at my mercy,' thought he, and marched with a mighty host to the city, and beleaguered it. Straight the gates were closed, and a message was sent to the king of Kosala. Our queen is near the time of her delivery, and the astrologers have declared that in seven days she shall bear a son. If she bears a son, we will not yield the kingdom, but on the seventh day we will give you battle. For so long we pray you wait. And to this the king agreed. In seven days the queen bore a son. On his name day they called him Prince Winhart, because, said they, he was born to win the hearts of the people. On the very same day that he was born, the townsfolk began to do battle with the king of Kosala. But as they had no leader, little by little the army gave way, great though it was. The courtiers told this news to the queen, adding, Since our army loses ground in this way, we fear defeat. But the state elephant, our king's bosom friend, has never been told that the king is dead, and a son born to him, and that the king of Kosala is here to give us battle. Shall we tell him? Yes, do so, said the queen. So she dressed up her son and laid him in a fine linen cloth, after which she, with all the court, came down from the palace and entered the elephant's stable. There she laid the babe at the elephant's feet, saying, Master, your comrade is dead, but we feared to tell it to you, lest you might break your heart. This is your comrade's son, the king of Kosala has run a leaguer about the city, and is making war upon your son. The army is losing ground. Either kill your son yourself, or else win the kingdom back for him. At once the elephant stroked the child with his trunk, and lifted him upon his own head. Then making moan and lamentation, he took him down and laid him in his mother's arms, and with the words, I will master the king of Kosala. He went forth hastily. Then the courtiers put his armor and comparison on him, and unlocked the city gate, and escorted him thither. The elephant emerging trumpeted, and frightened all the host, so that they ran away, and broke up the camp. Then seizing the king of Kosala by his topknot, he carried him to the young prince, at whose feet he let him fall. Some rose to kill him, but them the elephant stayed and he let the captive king go with this advice. Be careful for the future, and be not presumptuous by reason that our prince is young. 
After that, the power over all India fell into the Bodhisatta's own hand, and not a foe was able to rise up against him. The Bodhisatta was consecrated at the age of seven years as King Winhart. Just was his reign, and when he came to life's end, he attained to heaven. THE PET ELEPHANT Once upon a time, while Brahmadatta was king of Benares, the Bodhisatta was born of a Brahmin family. On growing up, he left his worldly home and took to the religious life and in time became the leader of a company of five hundred anchorites, who all lived together in the region of Himalaya. Amongst these anchorites was a headstrong and unteachable person named Indasamana Gota. He had a pet elephant. The Bodhisatta sent for him when he found this out, and asked if he really did keep a young elephant. Yes, the man said. He had an elephant which lost its dom. Well, said the Bodhisatta, when elephants grow up they kill even those who foster them, so you had better not keep it any longer. But I can't live without him, my teacher, was the reply. Oh, well, said the Bodhisatta, you'll live to repent it. Howbeit, he still reared the creature, and by and by it grew to an immense size. It happened once that the anchorites had all gone far afield to gather roots and fruits in the forest, and they were absent for several days. At the first breath of the south wind, this elephant fell in a frenzy. "'Destruction to this hut,' thought he. "'I'll smash the water jar. I'll overturn the stone bench. I'll tear up the pallet. I'll kill the hermit, and then off I'll go.' So he sped into the jungle and waited, watching for their return. His master came first, laden with food for his pet. As soon as he saw him, he hastened up, thinking all was well. Out rushed the elephant from the thicket, and seizing him in his trunk, dashed him to the ground, then with a blow on the head crushed the life out of him, and madly trumpeting, he scampered into the forest. The other anchorites brought this news to the Bodhisatta, said he, We should have no dealings with the bad. And then he repeated these two verses, Friendship with evil let the good eschew, the good who know what duty bids them do, they will work mischief, be it soon or late, even as the elephant his master slew. But if a kindred spirit thou shalt see, in virtue, wisdom, learning like to thee, choose such a one to be thine own true friend, good friends and blessing go in company. In this way, the Bodhisatta showed his band of anchorites that it is well to be docile and not obstinate. Then he performed Indasamana Gota's obsequies, and, cultivating the excellences, came at last into Brahma's heaven. The Mongoose and the Snake Once on a time, when Brahmadatta was king of Benares, the Bodhisatta was born in a certain village as one of a Brahmin family. When he came of age, he was educated at Dakisala. Then, renouncing the world, he became a recluse, cultivated the faculties and the attainments, and dwelt in the region of Himalaya, living upon wild roots and fruits which he picked up in his goings to and fro. At the end of his cloistered walk lived a mongoose in an ant-heap, and not far off a snake lived in a hollow tree. These two, snake and mongoose, were perpetually quarrelling. The Bodhisatta preached to them the misery of quarrels and the blessing of cultivating friendship, and reconciled the two together, saying, you ought to cease your quarreling and live together at one. When the serpent was abroad, the mongoose at the end of the walk lay with his head out of the hole in his anthill, and his mouth open, and thus fell asleep, heavily drawing his breath in and out. The bodhisatta saw him sleeping there, and asking him, Why, what are you afraid of? repeated the first stanza. Creature, your egg-born enemy a faithful friend is made, why sleep you there with teeth all bare? Of what are you afraid? Father, said the mongoose, never despise a former enemy, but always suspect him. And he repeated the second stanza. Never despise an enemy, nor ever trust a friend. A fear that springs from unfeared things uproots and makes an end. Fear not, replied the Bodhisatta, I have persuaded the snake to do you no harm, distrust him no more. 
With this advice, he proceeded to cultivate the four excellences and became destined for Brahma's heaven, and the others, too, passed away to fare hereafter according to their deeds. THE JACKAL BETRAYED BY HIS HOWL Once upon a time, when Brahmadatta was reigning in Banaras, the Bodhisatta was born as a young lion, and the king of many lions. With a suite of lions he dwelt in Silver Cave. Nearby was a jackal living in another cave. One day, after a shower of rain, all the lions were together at the entrance of their leader's cave, roaring loudly and gambling about as lions use. As they were thus roaring and playing, the jackal too lifted up his voice. "'Here's this jackal giving tongue along with us,' said the lions. They felt ashamed and were silent. When they all fell silent, the bodhisattva's cub asked him this question. "'Father, all these lions that were roaring and playing about have fallen silent for very shame on hearing yon creature. What creature is it that betrays itself thus by its voice?' And he repeated the first stanza. "'Who is it, with a mighty cry, makes Dadara resound? Who is it, lord of beasts, and why has he no welcome found?' At his son's words, the old lion repeated the second stanza. "'The jackal of all beasts most vile, tis he that makes that sound. The lions loathe his business while they sit in silence round.'" End of section 15